question I think that was not yeah. 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 yeah, you can just go to my hand and oh. discuss it and then, then we yeah? We are sending it now. Sambo Nan, Sambo Nan. Njana.
Eta, thank you so much. Uh, let me take this opportunity to welcome you all of you here. Uh, we are thrilled and excited to host uh, this lecture as the Herikwala uh, Foundation. Uh, we want to welcome the family, the board members um, of, 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 of the foundation, uh, a member of the NEC and our guest speaker. Thank you so much for agreeing to, to be here. We, we, we have no words to explain how excited we are. Uh, to us, this is a very important day, uh, and regardless of the difficulties and the challenges that we find ourselves in as a country, we felt that we can miss other things, but not this day. Um, and it was within that context that we felt that we should arrange uh, this uh, memorial lecture. I don't want to waste time. I will uh, formally welcome uh, a person that has been given a huge task to ensure that there is political education and political action in the entire movement, and has executed that mandate uh, nicely and beautifully. And uh, we want to really thank him, uh, especially the Oliver Tambo uh, uh, School of Leadership for agreeing to partner with us as the foundation. Uh, Comrade uh, Dr. David Masson, may you do come to uh, the welcome and to really give us that opportunity to work with you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> uh, thanks, Comrade Panyanza, uh, the former General Secretary of the Communist Party. Comrade Charles Nakula will be giving us the lecture today. We really uh, thrilled that you agreed to come and uh, give a lecture about uh, Herikwala, the man of steel. Herikwala, who has played a major role in liberating us from the yokes of uh, apartheid colonialism. But of course, we still have a task as <coughs> Marxists, as communists, to transcend the system in which we live in, which is a capitalist uh, society. Uh, so Gwala has left us with a rich history, theoretical tools, <coughs> and, uh, and, and, and strategies on how we should work together to basically pursue the struggle for freedom. And as Oar Tambo School of Leadership, we really are excited that uh, Eric Gwala Foundation is keeping Eric Gwala's legacy. And ourselves as Oar Tambo School of Leadership, we were also planning to commemorate, to celebrate the lives and times of Harry Gwala. So before COVID, we had a, a couple of activities and plans that we had laid out to celebrate, remember, and, and, and make sure that Harry Gwala's legacy doesn't die. It lives because it is a relevant legacy which provides us with good values, with good vision, with uh, some sense of militancy, many of you you might have heard a lot about Harry Gwala as a very militant, committed leader, uh, was serious about political education. So as Oar Tambo School of Leadership, we'll continue to work uh, together with the Harry Gwala Foundation <coughs> to make sure that his legacy lives and it lives longer uh, until we are um, happy about the conditions under which the working class will be living. So with those few words, I really thank you, and we're looking forward, uh, Comrade Charles, to your uh, lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Comrade David. Truly appreciate it. <clears throat> uh, members of the Heri Kuala Foundation, family and relatives of Comrade Heri Kuala, represented here by Comrade Lind. Comrade Charles Ngakula, the former General Secretary of the South African Communist Party. Comrade David Masondo, who is representing the Oliver Tambo School of Leadership. Honored guests, comrades and friends. It was exactly on this day, 25 years ago, that Comrade Harry Temba Kuala's heart failed to beat again. He died at his family home in Dambuza, just outside Peter Marisbeck, KwaZulu Natal. Till today, there is no grave big enough to carry the stalwart of our revolution. To us, Harry Kuala is everything. 
a father, a granddad, a leader, a teacher, a trade unionist, but most importantly, a revolutionary communist. We didn't choose him. His writings and thoughts chose us. His bravery made us to be attracted to him, the lion of the Midlands. We didn't choose him outside other names. His name cannot be separated from our struggle against apartheid and colonialism. So his name is too special to be forgotten. Hence we felt, even under these difficult conditions of a virus, let's have a moment to honor this giant of our revolution. He didn't take it kindly that during the Cordesa negotiations, when the right-wing forces invaded the Cordesa venue in Captain Park, he was seriously disgusted when he briefed us, when he said he was angry that some of our leaders, properly trained by MK, chose to hide under the tables and chairs rather than confront the enemy head on. He felt that they betrayed the revolutionary call to defend the revolution at all times. So it is his writings, his teachings, and most importantly, his bravery that will forever make us to miss him. He will not take kind that our land is still in the hands of those that stole it. He will be angry with us that the colonial and apartheid name still embrace our streets, dams, buildings, schools, and many other places. Hence his resting place at Kwasaimani, we feel as the foundation, it should be declared a heritage site, a site that can always remind us that this is the place this giant is resting. It is for this reason that tomorrow morning we'll visit his grave, not to lament on the many challenges that we face, but to garner strength and wisdom as we continue to build a just South Africa. We will surely be angry that we've created a country within a country with something that no longer makes sense that is called Orania, a right-wing state for predominantly white Africaners. It has its own currency, its own schools, and its own laws. He will surely have said to us, I told you, that the party that is the SACP should remain a vanguard party rather than a mass party, thus attracting challenges faced by mass parties like the ANC in the SACP. We would have argued, strongly so, that our agenda to eradicate poverty, unemployment, and homelessness need to be accelerated so that our people can be liberated. So today, we are here to honor this giant of our revolution, a fearless leader, a champion of the poor. The best way to honor this gallant hero and militant of our struggle is for the ANC and the South African Communist Party Alliance to move with speed to champion a revolutionary agenda that places the Freedom Charter at the center of our work, both in the state, but most importantly, within our organization. We are here to say, we'll never disown you, hey, Ritemba Kuala. You may be gone, but you are forever in our minds. Whatever we do, we remain inspired by your teachings. So we are here and excited that we are introducing somebody that worked closely with you, a former journalist, a diplomat, a writer, a political guru, that has agreed to come and deliver this lecture in your honor. We are committed to ensure that your name lives long and your name is respected and that your stranded history that was written about you is corrected. Who's better place to do this than Comrade Charles Ngakul? He committed to us that is going to be frank and brutal with the truth. He said, is going to present what was never presented before or make information that will make us understand who Harry Kuala was and who Harry Kuala is. Comrade Charles has held various portfolios in cabinet, was the Deputy Secretary General of the SACP 
while Comrade Chris Ahn was the General Secretary. He later took over as the General Secretary after Comrade Chris Ahn was brutally assassinated by the apartheid forces. Comrades and friends, revolutionaries and honored guests, allow me to call upon Comrade Charles Ngakula to deliver a lecture in honor of one of the fearless leaders and orator of note, Comrade Mpepetwa, Istwalandwe, Heri, Temba, Kuala. Comrade Charles. Thank you very much, Chairperson. <clears throat> and I do want to align myself to the very beautiful words you and Comrade David uttered here today. I feel especially honored that you invited me to come and deliver a lecture on our leader, a courageous leader, Comrade Harry Tembagwala. I am happy that you have remembered him and you continue to remember him. Now you have described him as a man of steel, thereby indicating that Comrade Harry was a committed revolutionary, a leader who would always be found to be leading the struggling masses of our country from the front, to face the enemy of our people and their proxies. You would always find him leading our people and defending them against all manner of problematic uh, circumstances. This is the man you've decided we should today remember. I want, in the first instance, to appreciate what the Kuala family has done, not just to have allowed the foundation to organize this event, but also because you believed in Comrade Harry's cause. You believed in the cause of his people. The prosecution of the project to liberate our people from oppression and exploitation needed people like Comrade Harry Kuala. You always worked with him as he was part of the revolution. You were always together with him when he was struggling to bring about thoroughgoing democracy for the people of our country. And you believed it was correct for him to continue to work despite many episodes of harassment, including when he was incarcerated on Robben Island twice for his participation in our struggle. You did not stop him from his dedication to continue to serve our people, even as his health was becoming a big challenge for both him and yourselves as his family. Of course, <coughs> you suffered with him. When the Communist Party, in its wisdom, decided to suspend him, now, there's something I wish to share with you, which is in a book that I wrote about his suspension. Now, it goes like this. Party comrades in some parts of KwaZulu-Natal we are unhappy about the old man's conduct, including his propensity to show disrespect for leaders of the movement, including Madiba. You know that Comrade Harry did
did not fear anyone. He did not fear the ruthless enemy of our people, but he also did not fear anybody within the revolutionary movement and therefore spoke his mind. There are some people who defined him as someone who was abrasive and someone who at times would even display a tint of some arrogance, what is called intellectual arrogance. But that's not how I saw him, hence what I have written here. We had a long discussion about the matter of his suspension at a meeting of the Politburo at a time when I was General Secretary. I was unhappy about the direction of the discussion. Although I was not blind to the way Comrade Guala tended to rub comrades up the wrong way, I spoke up for him. Throughout my life, my view always has been that it is better for justice to be seen to be done. You have to put charges to those you allege may have committed some infractions to give them an opportunity to explain themselves in a properly structured forum. I said that we needed to call him and try to persuade him to change his behavior if he felt that he was doing anything wrong, which had the potential to divide the Congress and mass democratic movements. I was defeated. And in the end, the Politburo decided he had to be suspended. It's a matter of history that at the beginning of July 1994, the Central Committee receiving a recommendation from the Politburo did suspend Great Kuala for six months. But before the end of, of those six months, the decision to suspend him was rescinded. And I was asked, together with Comrade Raymond Mshaba, who was chairperson of the party at the time, to go and convey this rescission of his suspension to him. Of course, one of the saddest things relating to this, I believe, led to his ill health. Shortly after the suspension, he became ill. And of course, we went uh, to, to see him at his home in Peter Marisberg. And on that day, we found him in bed. Of course, he still insisted to get out of bed, the courageous person that he always was. And we went outside where we sat on the veranda. When I conveyed to him the decision of the, of the Central Committee, he shared tears. In my book, I describe that moment for him to have been a happy moment. But I knew deep down in my heart that it was not tears of happiness that he shared may have been tears of sadness. Because he may have seen some of the things that we had begun to do as the entire revolutionary movement of our people led by the African National Congress. And he had seen some of the infractions, some of the mistakes we were committing. And Comrade Kuala, the courageous person that he was, wanted to deal with some of those sins of both commission and omission. But I always try to figure what would have happened if Comrade Chris Ani had not been murdered and was alive and was attending the same Politburo meeting? What would have been his position? I'm certain that he would have opposed the suspension, particularly because 
It was not based on any democratic principle. In fact, it sounded like we were Stalinist in taking a decision to suspend someone without providing them an opportunity to defend themselves. Comrade Chris, in my book, loved Comrade Kuala. Comrade Chris was possibly the only one who respected the line of the Midlands the way that he did. And I'm sure he would have defended Comrade Kuala. I also wish, Chairperson, to convey appreciation to your foundation for keeping the legacy of Comrade Harry Kuala alive. And I'm so happy that you have also decided to visit his grave site tomorrow, but not only that, to argue that it also is depicted and accepted by our leadership as a heritage site. Now, <clears throat> you know, if Comrade Gwala was still alive, he would have been a mirror that would have projected our situation at this time as it is. If he was alive, Comrade Guala would have made us to think. And his thinking would have taken our organization down the correct path of a developmental state. In six days to come, the 26th of June, we ought to be raising the Freedom Charter. You would have insisted that we do that. The 26th of June, before the democratic breakthrough, was our holiday in the Alliance. And we recognized it on the basis of what had happened in the struggle as our holiday, our Freedom Day. Now, by doing what you have done, you have barked a trend that is worrisome in our revolutionary movement. Because what has happened, there's emerged a grouping of people who come from the movement, who have become antagonistic to theory and ideology, and who have abandoned the history of our struggle and who are hostile to experience. Now, by kicking to touch those things, what have they embraced? They have embraced personal aggrandizement and embraced the propensity for the accumulation of wealth through corrupt means and, of course, politics of patronage are at large, even during this time of COVID-19. But Umdom Dala, as we fondly used to refer to him if he was alive, he would have continued to teach his students, old and young, what revolutionary theory means and the necessity as a revolutionary to embrace revolutionary morality. They would have continued to do that. Now, when we defined him as Mdum Dala, it was not exclusively in recognition of his age, but also it had to do with the fact that he was a repository of wisdom. Now, some of you here, I know Chairperson, 
you also benefited from this. Received lessons from him as he delivered his lectures, as I've said, to both old and young people. When he raised issues like the theory of our revolution, as well as theory and ideology. Unlike other people, other leaders in the revolutionary organization, especially the alliance led by the African National Congress, he was a member of each one of the units of that alliance. He was a member of the ANC. And as such, he was always available to teach people about the elements of the National Democratic Revolution. Now, there is a story that Comrade Tabo would tell about their visit to Cuba with President O.R. Tambo before, of course, the unbending of our organizations. And when they met with President Fidel Castro, he had in front of him a copy of the Freedom Charter. And he asked Comrade O.R., looking at each one of the clauses of the Constitution, when you say this, how are you going to implement it? Do you have a program, in other words, to implement the Freedom Charter? Comrade Harry Guala would have been pushing for that. In fact, if you are still alive today, and on the 26th of June, we would have some sort of meeting, you would have said, here is the Freedom Charter. Tell me which one of the clauses of the charter have we actually implemented. We would have been hard pressed to indicate what we would have done. In other words, to do what the framers of the Freedom Charter wanted us to do. As our primary goal to provide our people with thoroughgoing democracy. Of course, he was also a member of the South African Communist Party. And as such, he played a role in teaching, even as he was on Robben Island, people about Marxism, Leninism, towards socialism. Even now, he would have been insisting that the struggle for socialism has not died. Socialism is still an important goal to go for. He would have said that. And of course, he would have lambasted the party for the position that it took with respect to what happened in Corsato. Now, <clears throat> you will remember that going to the 2017 ANC National Conference, Comrade Zuelin Zimavavi, then General Secretary of Corsato, defined what was going to happen there as a tsunami. Now, in my book, I've written that he did not know that that tsunami would not only affect Mbeki and whoever else, but it would affect in a very, very deep way the entire alliance of our people. More than that, he did not know that it would affect directly Kosato itself. And when there were problems in Kosato, D. 
decided to suspend NUMSA. That was the beginning of the end for unity within the working class. This is what I wrote in my book <coughs> relating to that matter. And of course, addressing myself to the South African Communist Party. I'm raising this because it is public. It's in my book, which was published a number of years ago. The SACP was not directly hit by the tsunami that Bavavi was talking about. But the mighty waves of discontent within the Congress movement did have an impact. The party, either deliberately or inadvertently, gave the tsunami impetus when it took sides in conflicts between worker groups. For example, it took sides in the conflict on the Rustenberg Platinum Belt between the National Union of Mine Workers and a new worker organization, the Association of Mine Workers and Construction Union, AMCO. The party nailed its colors to the NUM must and treated AMCO as an enemy. The SSCP is the political home of the working class, the entire working class. And no member should feel any joy when working class organizations break up. Nor should party members be at the forefront of causing disunity within the labor movement. The party's main project must be to mobilize all workers to accept it as their organization, the political home of the working class. I've raised this thing in the party, and therefore, it is not anything new. What are the other things that the lion of the Midlands would have raised strongly at this time. One of them, of course, is the issue of land. But listen to what we have done as a revolutionary movement. We've changed history to our disadvantage and to the advantage of our enemy. A decision was taken some time back that we should tweak the history of this country by saying that the Anglo-Boer War is a South African war. That is what you will find now. We no longer talk about the Anglo-Boer War. We talk about the South African War. It never was a South African war. The Anglo-Boer War was a war between the English and the Boers here in South Africa. What were they fighting for? What was the spoil? The spoil was our land. If you don't believe that, 1902, these people signed a convention and they divide our country among themselves. Which led in 1913 to the Native Land Act, Natives Land Act. And I like how one of our leaders, our philosophers, courageous people, defined that moment when our land was taken away from us through the so-called Natives Land Act. Our own soul blighty. 
he wrote in his book, Native Life in South Africa. He wrote this. Awakening on Friday morning. Do you know what that date was? June 20. Awakening on Friday morning. It is Saturday today, but June 20, 1913. The South African native found himself not actually a slave, but a pariah in the land of his birth. This is what the anglo Boer War was about, to consolidate their triumph over us by taking our land away. Now, the issue of the, 13th, of the 1913 Land Act became an issue that many congresses of the ANC spoke about and took resolutions on. Now, can you imagine what Comrade Kuala would have said? When life continued as usual in South Africa during our time, on the 23rd, on the 23rd of April, last year, 23rd of April last year, was the bicentennial of the attack by Makanda on Gramstown. 200 years. What was that about? It was about the fact that Makanda persuaded his king, Dambe, for them in defense of our land. Because defending our land, we were defending our freedom as a people. He said, let us attack these people at Gramstown. Of course, Gramstown was not one word. It was Graham's town. It was a town, it was the originally a settlement of people from Britain. And of course, they were guarded by the colonial forces. And the colonial forces at the time were led by John Graham. And who was the governor? The governor was a person who also invaded our land in a town where I was born, Craddock, John Craddock. In 1812, he established that area as his own, John Craddock's land. In 1811, he instructs his commander of his colonial forces, John Graham, to attack our people between what they went on to call the Hamtuas River. That's the original name, Chalekwa. Who was there? The people who were there were Amakunkwa, what today are called the Khoi, led at the time by Dave David Stirman. He said that land from the Hamtuas River to the Fish River must be cleared for colonial settlement. And he says to his commander, go and attack these people on Christmas Day. They did not even know our customs, our traditions, our way of life. He thought that we, there's something like Christmas that our people were celebrating. Our people were not celebrating Christmas, did not even know about Christmas at that time. But he said to him, you must kill everything that moves on four legs. Bar their cattle, we want their cattle. Now, as a sign of their triumphalism, 
after they had captured Makanda. As a sign of that, in 1820, they brought in to Grahamstown more people from Britain. And they established a monument in their name, 1820 British Settlers Monument, as a sign of their triumphalism. Comrade Kuala would have said, use the 23rd of April 2019, 200 years, to commemorate the bravery of those who went against Grimstar. Let's teach our children to understand that among our people, there have been heroes and heroines who were ready to lay down their lives in order for them to preserve and protect our freedom. And did we do it? Does anybody here know if we had a celebration like that, commemorating that bravery? We never did. And in perpetua would have been annoyed by that. Now the other thing that in perpetua would have worried no end about is the disunity in our ranks. Now the first person, at least in recent years, who raised that disunity starkly as our former president, Jacob Zuma. On the 8th of January, 2017, he raised that matter. And in, but he raised for me something very interesting because he lifted up the Morogoro Conference and said, when there were difficulties in the ANC. And he says, when he explains that, before the Morogoro Conference, there was unhappiness in the ranks of the movement. That's what he said. But after the Morogoro Conference, those problems were resolved because our leadership were able to put all the problems on the table and said, these are the things that are causing disunity among us and unhappiness. Therefore, let us define a program in order for us to deal with these matters and save our organization and give our organization the strength that it needs in order for it to lead our people towards our freedom. This is being raised by Comrade JZ, the, what, January 8, 2017. He then says, the problems that we have are the divisions in our movement caused by factionalism, caused by the manipulation of the processes of our organization and right through, right through the alliance, including the mass democratic movement. This is what he said. And then he says, relevant to that, therefore, we as leaders need to deal with this matter. Is there anybody in the room who can with all confidence tell me that these matters were resolved? Do you know why they were not resolved? I thought when President Zuma raised the Morogoro Conference, where in the end he says, before the Morogoro Conference, unhappiness, disunity. After that, the movement is strong and was able to discharge its, its, its mandate to tell you 
the truth of that statement is when in 1985 the movement met again in a small town north of Lusaga in Zambia called Gabon in a second consultative conference to receive reports of what the ANC had done following the Morocco Conference. And it was clear to everybody there that indeed the ANC had moved forward in terms of our struggle. To a point where Joe Slovo, being able to read the signs, was able to say the next conference of the ANC will happen inside South Africa. He says this is 1985. The next conference of the ANC will happen inside the country because the revolutionary movement had arisen inside South Africa. Our people were confronting the enemy directly. And in certain parts of our country, particularly the youth, it created conditions for our people to destroy the local authorities that had been established by apartheid and established people's organizations of power. Units of power were established. And Joe Slovo says the next conference of the ANC will happen inside South Africa. Did it not happen inside South Africa? It did. 1991, we were back here from 1990, five years from the day. 1990, we were unbanned. And we had to prepare for this conference, which happened in 1991. But we were unbanned in 1990. Why am I raising this? I am raising it because given the statement that President Zuma made about the problems of the ANC in 2017 and raising the Morogoro Conference, I thought he was then saying to the movement, let's convene a consultative meeting of the ANC and once more do what was done in Morogoro in order for us to save our movement. I thought that is what he was saying. Then, mid-year 2017, the ANC has its policy conference. And the then Secretary General of the ANC, Gwede Mandashe, presents to that conference what he had depicted as a diagnostic analysis of the ANC and spoke about the same things that caused this unit. But of course, anybody who was at that uh, policy conference will remember this. There was hostility towards that report. Do you know why? Because there's anybody wanting to deal with the causes of the divisions would also be, therefore, trembling on people's toes who want access to the people's resources. They want to steal the people's resources. Now, if you come with something that is designed to correct and redirect our organization so that once more, it is imbued by this spirit of revolution and revolutionary morality. And those who are part and parcel of these divisions don't want that. But Comrade Guala would have argued for this. Now, if last year, we would have convened that consultative conference. We would also, by the same token, commemorating the 50th anniversary 
of the Morocoro Conference, which was held on the 25th of April, 1969. Chairperson, I want to try to, to, to go to the end. I'm sure I've already taken, oh, okay. Now, I want to finish. And I want to finish by raising something that I love. Something that I love. Last year, we were completing 25 years of our democracy. Now, <clears throat> surely, if Kuala was still alive, he would have said, we can't end this year, the 25 years of our democracy. We can't end them without raising our national anthem. Why raise our national anthem? Firstly, it's a new anthem of a new nation, the South African nation, of people who come from different backgrounds, but who are connected to the same things, a constitution that we all drafted, and an anthem, and a flag. Now, <clears throat> what type of national anthem do we have? We have a unique national anthem. There's no other country in the world that has an anthem like ours. The words of our anthem were written by three South Africans who come from totally different sociological backgrounds. The Tosa part was composed by a person highly religious from the Eastern Cape, from a small Dorby in the Eastern Cape, called Yudnik, near Port Elizabeth, in Oxondong. He composed Nkosi Sigelela as a church hymn. Later, in 1924, he composed this around the 1890s. 1924, a white person, an African, composes as a poem, Distem. That even is part of our national anthem. Then, the provincial secretary of the then Transvaal, of the ANC, Moses Mpahlele, you've spoken about uh, Mtom Dala's grave being declared a heritage site. The house where Moses Mpahlele composed Murena Uluka is still there in Limpopo. Now, is it not possible for us to declare even that house as a heritage site? But if we are hostile even to our history, are we going to remember some of those things? Are our children going to remember these things if we ourselves and we 
our own generation knows about them because people like Henry Kwala raised them as part and parcel of the political education we're getting from you. Now, <clears throat> what would have Kwala said about this anthem? He would have said, before the end of last year, let us recognize these three people because they constitute what is in our constitution of people who come from different backgrounds, but who are united by the zeal to make our country a united country. Kuala would have argued that we do this. I want to bring this to an end by saying <clears throat> the young people in our country, especially those who are part and parcel of the political spectrum in the country, ought to be given an opportunity. One of leadership in certain respects, but secondly, for them to understand these things because there is nothing as dangerous as a void where there is no percolation of ideas for our young ones in order for them as they move forward to have a proper springboard of the revolutionary ideals of our people and where we would like to get to. Fortunately, unlike us, our children are educated. They ought to be able, therefore, to define certain things. You are responsible for education here. And our children were clamoring for the decolonization of education. Did you, as young people who are here, sit down and theorize that matter? Theorizing what that concept means, the decolonization of our education. Because we must admit, the education that we have is not the education that we thought we would have. It is not. Therefore, particularly the young people, especially those that still at, 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 at university, ought to be able to look at those things that would ensure that the education, what they leave behind for their young brothers and sisters, is an education that is better than what we have. But do we engage our young people so that we can get to that level? We don't. The mistake is ours, but also the mistake of these young people, some of them, because they are hostile to experience. They don't want to be told by old people about these matters. So this is a challenge to all of us that we need to ensure, particularly on the 26th of June, when again we look, take a real look of our Freedom Charter. And we ourselves do what Harry Kuala would have done. Let's look at all those clauses and ask our question, our, ourselves the question, have we been able to do the things that are in the Freedom Charter? And if not, why? What can we do? I appreciate. And comrade Harry Kuala also appreciated this. That is why in the beginning he was even able to serve for a short stint in, in the province in KwaZulu-Natal. 
we all appreciated that we needed to make some concessions in order for us to get as quickly as possible to the levers of power. But having gone in, we thought that we would then use those levers of power to transform this country completely. Now, we must ask ourselves on the 26th of June, as Guala would have done, what do we need to do at this point in order for us to arrive at the goal which was not set by us, which was set by our forebears who suffered as a consequence of this. Many of them were incarcerated, not just on Robben Island, but on other prisons of our country. We need to do that. My final word is to record my appreciation that you decided you were going to work with everybody to ensure that we are able to do the things that we need to do and raise for us to structure a legacy around people and events that talk to the struggle for our freedom. I therefore like the fact that the O.R. Tambo School of Leadership has a partnership with you. Because I believe that that School of Leadership is going to go quite some distance in turning around the way we think for the benefit of reconstructing our lives so that in the end everybody can say, indeed, as a consequence of the revolution that was led by the African National Congress, we today have a better life. Once more, thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Congress Charles. You, you were magnificent. You, you went beyond our expectations. Uh, on behalf of the Heri Kuala Foundation, we want to thank you so much. Thank you for sharing the ideas that you have shared with us. We are indeed grateful. I think, comrades, as we prepare to migrate to Swaiman to visit the grave of this giant tomorrow, we are indeed inspired by the thoughts given to us by Comrade Charles. We'll continue to have this debate on the road as we go uh, to Swaiman. We also want to indicate that we are going to that grave not to lament, but to re-energize ourselves. We are not going there to complain. When we go there and lay those wreaths there, we are just saying, guide us. Make us better leaders, better people, but ensure that as always, that our people are at the center of everything that we are doing. I also want to thank the family, as I said, represented by Budlinda here, for always being there with us and for allowing us to use this name to champion the cause of everything that he stood for. Comrade Charles, we might not agree, and that's why some of us are inspired by Comrade Eric Wala, is that he was not differing with people for the sake of differing. We'll put arguments why he differs. And we can say it now in this public platform, and I've said it before, that non-racialism is non-negotiable. And if we champion non-racialism, anything that does not symbolize non-racialism will be the first one to crush it. 
and therefore our argument about institutions and things that don't promote non-racialism, we must know that we'll crush them uh, and will not hesitate to indicate that there are things that you are not happy with them. We know, and I'm glad you've said that, Comrade Charles, we know why we compromised. We know why we participated in some of the institutions. We know why we agreed to some of the institutions. But the time has arrived that we reflect on some of those agreements. Where we stand, if we build a future of non-racialism, we don't think a certain area called Orania feature in that future. It doesn't. You can't have a segment of our country that have its own currency, that have its own laws and regulations, and the only permit you need to, to recite there is the color of your skin. If you allow such institutions, we think that will be betraying people like Eric Wally. But also, we must defend the poor and the weak in the conditions that they are in as we speak. And therefore, when we honor Comrade Krisani, we honor him to rededicate ourselves that the poor must not be poor forever. But the period and time in our country must come to break those chains that surround the poor, the homeless, and those that are unemployed. So thanks for the inspiration. We truly appreciate it. I want also to thank the, school of, the Oliver Tambo School of Leadership, the ANC, for the support that they've given us, and, then, and the statement they've released today to honor Comrade Herikwa. They've captured who Herikwa was together with the party, the South African Communist Party, and the Labor Federation, COSATU, for being part of our programs since we started this route. As we close, we can confirm that Heri Kuala is us. We are Heri Kuala, not only for today, nor for tomorrow, but forever. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Thank <laughs> 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 you.